Thanks for tuning in to Border State Rock Talk. You get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and comment below. Before I get to my guests, everybody stay tuned because not only do we have the great Greg Chasson with us today, we got Wendy Deal <laughs> coming up in about a week. Everybody will know Wendy, uh, or the, the widow of uh, the late, great Ronnie James Deal. So now, without further ado, I bring to you Greg Chasson. Is it Chasson or Chasson? How well, do you pronounce it? If we're if we're in Canada, it's Chasson. But if we're here in uh, in Arizona, it's Chason. I was gonna say um, you were born and bred uh, in Toronto. When did you uh, uh, make your getaway out of uh, this country that's going downhill in Canada? <laughs> uh, when I was five years old, uh, my family moved to the United States. We moved up by uh, San Jose, San Francisco area of California. Oh, so you're a bright five year old leaving so soon no, you I, knew I mean, it was I, coming what's that yeah i said you're bright leaving at five you knew what was coming in <laughs> my country here you know i mean i love my country but it's uh obviously taking a turn uh well let's not talk politics so anyways how you been how you been doing what have you been up to i'm doing great i'm just uh playing a lot of baseball and i have a guitar store that i run called bizarre guitar and drum here in phoenix and uh i got two grandchildren that uh one that's uh eight, what 19 months and one that's about uh, nine days so uh that i plan on that keeping me busy that that's awesome actually my, it's my granddaughter's third today um it's kind of well thank you by the way for the bass lick that i put in the intro here everybody's gonna everybody loved that um cool. it's kind of interesting how you're a bass player and you're into baseball you ever think of that that's, that's right um, go figure was it just a quirky Canadian thing I'm thinking of? You know, it's funny. I was supposed to go to college to play baseball when I graduated high school. And uh, some kids in my neighborhood that were a few years younger asked me if I wanted to. They said, if you buy a bass, you can be in our band. And I went, uh, okay. And so I went to the pawn shop and bought a crappy $45 bass. And uh, they already had an amp. And they showed me parts of a half a dozen songs, and I decided that day that I would be a bass player. The funny I didn't know thing, playing baseball, I just didn't want to go to college. <laughs> right on. Well, I went to college. I graduated in partying. Anyways, um, well, I'm dyslexic, so just going through high school back in in my day in high school, they didn't have a term for dyslexia. Right. So there was it hasn't been diagnosed that way. So I have had a major issue with seeing letters and numbers backwards and yeah. putting them out of place, which made math an adventure all by itself. Same with English. I can imagine. I can certainly imagine. So um, I would like to say, and I think I'm on target saying you made your, you got your big break with Badlands. Yes. Um, Tell everybody, I know the story, but how did you get invited to be with uh, Jake and Badlands? Uh, you're at a you're at some rehearsal or a tryout for somebody that's kind of famous? Yeah, I got a call from uh, Sharon Osbourne wanting to know, uh, at the time, uh, back uh, backtrack here a second, at the time, Ozzy was looking for a bass player for the Ultimate Sin record, and they had decided that they would advertise it on the newly launched MTV and so uh, they got something like I don't know 7,000 people sent in a bio a photo and a short uh, tape of them playing or them playing a song or whatever and so I wasn't even going to do it because I figured what's the chances and uh, Bobby Blotzer from Rat who is one of my best friends said well, you need to do this. And, and, and another guy, which is a photographer named Ross Halfen, who had been like, um, uh, Iron Maiden and Metallica and a lot of, a lot of those kind of bands, Def Leppard's photographer. 
he was a good friend of mine as well. And he said, you should really do it. So I sent in a photo, a quick little bio and uh, a tape of me playing my, playing a song on a ghetto blaster, being recorded on another ghetto blaster with me playing the bass. So it wasn't even, it was just me noodling around. It was just, I did it so quick and dirty that I didn't, I just never thought anything would happen with it. And out of the blue, a couple months later, I get a phone call, uh, you know, and it's this woman and she says, hey, Greg, this is Sharon Osborne and we got your package and we'd love you to audition for Ozzy. And I said, hey, Blaster, this isn't funny. Screw you. And I hung up on her. <laughs> and so she called back and she said, uh, no, Greg, it really is Sharon Osborne and, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, F you, Bobby. And I hung up on her again. No she way. She back again, like all right in a row. And she said, no, it really is Sharon Osborne. If you hang up again. I'm not going to call you back. And I went, hmm, okay. So come to find out they had selected, I think, seven packages to, of people, that just total guys that they were interested in auditioning. And I happened to be one of them. And they had already auditioned six guys. So I was the seventh guy. And um, I, so I, I was like, okay, well, tell me where and when. She said, well, because I thought they were doing it in L.A. And I lived in L.A. at the time. And I thought, well, OK. Uh, and they were doing it. She said, well, actually, we're going to do it in Scotland. Um, oh, we're, we're, we're going to fly you to England, she said. And I thought, ah, man, I don't like flying. I didn't think I was going to get the gig. And the rumor was that Jake was not in Aussie at that time. And uh, I had seen Jake play when I was in L.A. previously. And I really liked his playing. And I thought, man, I really like to be in a band with a guitar player like this. You know, he was great on stage. His tone was great. Uh, he wrote great songs, obviously. He was just a great player. I thought he was like the complete total package. Um, right up there with Eddie Van Halen, who was probably when you put everything together, songwriting, playing the way he was on stage. I, mm -hmm. I thought they were very comparable. And Jake had a very unique style, which appealed to me. Um, he wasn't using a whammy bar, like 99.9% .9 of guitarists were at that time. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. So I said, well, you know, I don't really like flying. So, you know, and, and I, I, no, I, I'm sorry. I said, I don't really like London, which I'd never been to London. I just was trying to get out of it, if you can believe that. And she said, well, you're actually, we're just going to fly you to London. You're going to change planes and we're going to bring you up to Inverness, Scotland for the audition. And I went, Inverness, huh? I said, isn't that by Loch Ness? And she said, I'm just yeah. gonna say that. And I said, here's what, so here I am going, I'm going to make a deal with Sharon Osbourne, who I'm nobody. She's one of the most powerful women in music. And I said, I'll come to your damn audition. If you will promise me that someone will take me to Loch Ness. And she said, okay. So sure enough, they flew me up there. Uh, I auditioned for Ozzy. I, I was there for 21 days. And wow. someone took me to Loch Ness and uh, we didn't play any uh, songs, any previous Ozzy or Sabbath. They were just working on a new record and they would just have me play to while with the band playing was Randy Castillo, Jake and myself. We would play to what was going to the songs they were recording for uh, The Ultimate Sin. And they had a full blown recording studio up there. And so they would record everything. Well, early on, I realized Ozzy didn't really think I was I Ozzy didn't want me to have the gig because when he first met me he he was not he didn't think I had the right look for MTV for what was going on then and he's probably right I I look like this and uh you know um I had big hair and all that stuff but I'm you know I didn't really have that really slam cute look I was kind of a rugged you know Ray always used to com compare me to Sam Elliott. So I kind of had that Sam Elliott thing going on. So mm -hmm. I knew I wasn't getting the gig. Well, they ended up, I, you know, they sent me home and um, they ended up getting um, uh, Phil Susan. Right. And uh, mainly because Phil had a song, uh, Bark at, uh, not Bark at the Moon, uh, Shot in the Dark. Right. And so, uh, but through that, Jake and I, developed a friendship and we stayed friends the whole time that he was in Aussie. He would call me from the road. 
like in the middle of the night and I'd get up and we'd just talk about whatever. When he was home, he'd come by my place. We'd go to dinner or he'd come to dinner at my house. We just developed a really strong friendship. And so when, uh, let me see here. Can I do this? I'm getting I can't, I can't see it. The viewers can't see it. Uh, Greg. It's, it's blocking you. Um, so no. uh, when he left Ozzy, he had always told me if, when I leave Ozzy, I'm going to start my own band and, you know, you could be in it. I took that oh. to be as when I leave Ozzy, you're going to be in the band. Well, then I found out when he left Ozzy, he was going to audition bass players. And uh, so I auditioned with along with about 45 other guys. Yeah. And I auditioned three times and eventually got the gig. And there you go. Speaking of um, him taking you out for dinner, he was getting some, I would I would assume he was getting a couple decent paychecks um, from Ozzy. Um, was he paying? Sure. Pardon me? Was he paying the tab for di for dinner? Um, you know what? I, I don't remember, but I know he, um, my wife's a good cook and he would come over. She was my girlfriend at the time. He would, he liked to come over. The first time he ever came over for dinner, he called me, said, you want to go get something to eat? I said, well, my, my wife's uh, making something. Why don't you come over? And he goes, what's, what's she making? And I said, meatloaf. And he said, really? Is she, is it any good? I said, yeah. So he came over, he had just bought a 67 Corvette. So he drove over to my apartment that I had with his Corvette and parked it on the street and came in and had dinner. So I think almost every time that um, we got together, it was probably out for dinner at my house. And he may have paid or I may have paid, I don't remember <laughs> when we would go out. So it's just kind of, we probably took turns at it. I, I'm thinking that he he definitely has signed a lot of royalty checks because he's got a medical condition right now in his right hand. Is it from signing checks? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's from signing checks and autographs. <laughs> so so tell the viewers that tell the viewers that may not know, um, Greg, what's going on with Jake right now. He's um he's healthy, but he's got a small medical condition that it's very common. He's got uh, carpal tunnel syndrome in his right wrist, which is his picking wrist, and it affects. Yeah. The way that he plays and if you're familiar with jake's style there's a lot of staccato mm -hmm. very aggressive sort of picking and it affects it hurts and uh, i've had carpal tunnels surgery myself way back in the 70s and it makes his hand go numb mm -hmm. so um which is the same thing that happened with mine so he's been just waiting for his insurance to kick in so he can have this surgery and then i'm not sure what is uh next on uh, his plate, I'm not sure if it's a Red Dragon Cartel thing or something completely different, or maybe one or two things. Um, I just know that uh, for the most recent history here, he hasn't done much because playing is not really fun for him at the moment, but I know he plans to do something, mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't tell you uh, exactly what it is. It's and it's, it's a fair bet to say when he does plan to do something that you're probably going to be involved. I'm saying probably because I don't know, but no, you think? I mean, if he did Red Dragon Cartel again, um, I'm sure that he would call Anthony, um, their friends and and uh, they're good friends. And as far as I know, that there's no, no issue there. I mean, if he was going to do something completely different and and he wanted to call me up, he, I mean, we speak frequently or we text frequently um he knows that i would be up for you know doing whatever it is that whatever the next project he would do um he may do maybe he'll do red dragon and something completely different i don't know we've never discussed that particular thing because um i think he's just waiting to get the surgery so he yeah. can you know, i know there's been some rumors about just say that yeah jake's done he's never going to play again that's bull i mean Jake's a musician, uh, whether he's going to go on a year long world tour or not, probably not. I mean, who wants to do that? I know I don't, but, um, <laughs> whether he's going to play again and record again, I would say there's a hundred percent chance that that'll happen at some point. Perfect. And if he called me, I would be definitely up for it. Well, absolutely. Um, now you've, um, recently I've, um, I was, I interviewed Carlos, Ronnie and Stett. And you you wrote some music and you're a part of Freak Show, but you're you're saying that you're not really in the Freak Show band to tour. You're just you know doing some music. Is that the correct assessment? 
Well, Ronnie asked me to, he called me up and I knew Carlos and I, I've known Stanton Carlos for a long time. And, and, but I mean, not, we've never worked together and I don't think I was on anyone's radar for that, but mm -hmm. Ronnie Borcher, uh, the singer called me and said, Hey, would you like to, he actually contacted me on Facebook. Would you like to do this record? And, uh, I, I said, okay, sure. He sent me some demo stuff and I said, yeah, sure. And I recorded it, but I, and he wanted me to be in the band, which wasn't an issue, but I can't tour. So I have mm -hmm. a guitar store that I run. I have right. a commitment there for the next couple of years. And so, you know, he was talking about going out and doing four months with this band and three months with this band. And, and you know, um, I just couldn't fit it into my schedule um, yeah. to do right. it. So uh, I recommended someone else to play bass who played in the bit to just do the videos and do the tour and that kind of went south and then they were kind of stuck without anybody as far as for doing interviews and he asked me would i do a few interviews with them um to look you know for the whole band thing of the four guys on the record so i agreed to do mm -hmm. that ronnie's a good guy and he's real generous of, as far as uh i mean he gave everyone a 25 percent of the publishing of that record which uh to be completely uh transparent here i didn't write anything on there other than my bass parts ronnie wrote all the songs but then he gave mm -hmm. carlos Chistet and myself each 25 percent of uh, of that record and i thought wow who who even does that now whether i get any money from it or not i don't know i don't know what the record's been doing i just shot a video for them um for there's a new a new video for a song called uh, full on shred i think it's called it's an instrumental and what mm -hmm. we did is, since we're all in different states, yeah, we all shot the video from our own uh, personal place. So I shot mine in my store, and then they're just going to edit it together. And uh, that was really weird. I never shot a video that way. But uh, that should be out, I don't know, sometime this summer. I know they're planning on touring, or they have some dates set up for maybe September. But I, I wouldn't be... I won't be doing any of those. I, they have a touring bass player. Uh, uh, I think it's a, a guy that Stet knows. And I just did the video just because I played on the record and I played the bass on on that song. So. Well, that shows your integrity and it shows his integrity as well for doing that. And I know Carlos, well, no, he's not my chum, but I mean, I've interviewed him a few times. Great guy. And Stet um, is another great guy. So I'm going to ask you about your other side business. I guess you sell boots, like cowboy boots? <laughs> well... I collect cowboy boots and I do buy and sell them. I've got about 125 pairs. <clears throat> it's actually a, there's a whole group of people. I'm on a, I'm on a page on Facebook. That's got something like 40,000 members on it. And it's all guys that, and women that collect and trade and buy cowboy boots. So the room that we're doing this video interview in here or this zoom call is where I keep my bases and my cowboy boots. So behind me is just one rack of cowboy boots. There's a bunch more over here and a bunch more behind me over there and in this closet over here and some over here. So it's just a hobby of mine. And uh, um, I don't have a shoe foot fetish. I just like cowboy boots. Well, they're, 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 not, they're not cheap. And I'm gonna say this, your wife was very kind to set this technical part up. So in any good marriage, you know, everybody has their little thing. So since you get to buy all these boots, what does she get to do? What's her uh, thing? Whatever she wants. All right, there you go. <laughs> Good answer, whatever, Seth. She's probably whatever she wants. She's very frugal. So like when we go shopping, she'll try to find the sale or the least expensive thing. And I'll I'll find something and I'll say, Do you like this? And she'll say, Yeah. And and uh she'll look at the price tag. She goes, I I can't get that that's expensive and i just buy it okay, so yeah. she has a lot of pairs of cowboy boots my daughter still is at home she has probably 15 16 pairs and then my son who's married uh the father the father of my grandchildren he's got 25 pairs of boots so it's kind of a we're all kind of into it and uh, they are expensive but i um i have some pairs that are custom made that could well cost sixteen hundred dollars um but i all excuse me i also have pairs i buy on ebay used for a hundred dollars that are right. worth more than 
Yeah. So, or I'll, on the Cowboy Boot page I'm on on Facebook, I'll see people will sell them. I'll sell them. There's a lot of exotic, different things. There's and uh, they're made out of some skins you're not allowed to use anymore. So they're like some of these boots are fairly old from the uh, '60s. Does it have like a corny Facebook name like Cowboy Boots and Saddles or something like that? Cowboy Boot Collectors. No way. I was just guessing. So it's off. Cowboy Boot bit. Collectors, and I mean, uh, if you were to look up on this counter up here. Let's see, uh, right behind me. Okay. All, the, all these boots here are custom made by a guy named Esteban Ozuna. And um, he's in Tucson, which is a couple hours south of me here in Phoenix. And he's actually making me a pair of alligator boots right now. Um, that, And I'll show you something real quick here. He made me this. This is a uh, alligator skin um oh. guitar strap oh, oh strap yeah 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 so that's uh pure it's black cherry so it's pure alligator on there and then the back is kangaroo and so all these animals that they make cowboy boots out of whether it's uh alligators or kangaroos or ostrich or whatever sorry excuse me um they're all uh, farmed so they're mm -hmm. not you know that's not something that's poached out in the wild or anything like that so I have a number of different things, rattlesnake and, you know, crocodile, wow. you name it, anteater. And so they're all interesting. And it's a... What about armadillo? Do you guys, because that's, that's native. They used to make them. I don't have any. I don't have any armadillo boots, but I do have anteater boots. And uh, anteater looks like this. And you can't. You're not allowed to make anteater anymore. Can you see that? There you go. Yep, you yep. Can see the way that the yep. so oh, anteater, wow. anteater is protected. So this particular pair of boots, which is Tony Lama, which is made probably in 1977. So they wow. outlawed them in the early 80s. And so you have to buy what's called pre-band. And those okay. are pre-band anteaters. Wow. So when wow. I go on tour, you know, especially if we're going in Texas, I'm always looking for... I go to uh, like antique stores or stuff like that, or um, resale outlets, and they'll sell used cowboy boots. And I'm always looking for interesting things. You said antique stores, not anteater stores. Anteater stores, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, antique anteater stores. So, Greg, tell us what you're doing now. Like, um, you've um, you work with Pat Travers. I'm I'm pretty close to getting an interview. Well, I shouldn't say that. I'm waiting on word from somebody that's going to contact him. He's another fellow Canuck. Um, what have you been doing um, recently and um, anything um, to release? Or I did a record uh, that came out a little over a year ago called Cross Country Driver. And that is uh, a guitarist named James Harper. It's his brainchild, but he has Rob Lamoth right. singing on the record, who's uh, living in Canada. And uh, played in the River Dogs, sang in the River Dogs. Great songwriter, one of my favorite singers. His son, Xander, uh, plays drums on some of the record. And the interesting part about that is I did a solo record back in the 90s. And I had Rob come in and sing a song on it because it was a song I had written when I was in Badlands. And Ray had sang it. And I couldn't really do it justice uh, mm -hmm. Trying to do the singing after listening to Ray, so Rob came in and did a really good job, and he brought his then two or three year old son Xander to the studio, and for the day, and we hung out, and I get along really good with little kids, and you know I made a bunch of stupid jokes with them, and it was it was a cool time. Well, then fast forward to a couple of years ago, I do a record, and on I played it on five songs on this record. Xander's playing drums on a couple of them. A couple of them is Mike Mangini's playing drums. Uh, this guy, uh, K-Fib, or uh, I think that's how he goes, is the drummer from Extreme. He's playing on a song. I think on some of the other songs uh, that I didn't play on, obviously, Doug Pinnock plays bass on a couple tracks, and there's different people. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, very kind of River Dogs meets Badlands meets, oh, a number of different things and it's real cool so check that out cross country driver uh check out the freak show record that that's out that's cool and then i did 
had my own band called Atomic Kings. And uh, it's some guys in Phoenix that uh, Ryan McKay on guitar, Jimmy Taft on drums and Ken Runk on vocals. We did that for a year and a half or so. And then in February, I just kind of got burned out on it and quit. But as of late, um, we have been talking and Ryan works with me in the store. So we're always writing together. Ryan and I write 99% of the music. So we've been, we got together and discussed whether uh, it was time to maybe revisit Atomic Kings. And so uh, I know next week we're going to get together and rehearse for the first time since probably January. And uh, Ryan has some new material, as do I. So we're going to see what the uh, status of that. Does it make sense? Do we want to go forward? I mean, we're already good friends. I just uh, got to a point where I needed a break. And I, mm. uh, so that's going to be coming up. And then there's a buddy of mine named Greg Mara. Uh, and he has a band called Plenty Heavy. And I'm going to be playing on an EP that he has going, coming out. Um, I'm going to record it in August. Uh, he owns a company called GJM Guitars and he custom made me a bass. And the drummer on that is Jimmy DeAnda, who is currently with Lynch and had played in the uh, uh, Bull, uh, Bullet Boys. Yeah, Bullet Boys. Right, right. So he's, yeah, so he's a great drummer, and him, Jimmy and I go way back. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be just a trio. And uh, I can't think of anything else I have upcoming on my plate other than Atomic Kings, uh, maybe, and uh, for sure, uh, Plenty Heavy. And then, like I said, you know, someday... Uh, at some point, Jake might call me and or he might not. But if he does, he knows where I'm at and uh, he knows what my what my feelings are on the subject. So, uh, you know, I'd be down for that. I mean, I really enjoy there's a certain kind of guitarist I enjoy playing with. Number one, you got to be a really great rhythm player. And Jake is a great rhythm player. Um, Ryan, who plays in Atomic Kings, is a great rhythm player. So just being a great lead player and being a half ass rhythm player doesn't interest me. And so, you know, the, the way that Jake presents his voice as a musician, uh, as a guitar player has always appealed to me. Uh, the first time I ever saw him play, I was blown away by it. And, um, to, you know, to have done Badlands and I also play, spent some time in, uh, Red Dragon Cartel. Right. The only reason I left Red Dragon Cartel is because in 2015, summer of 2015, I was diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. Actually, you look I was great, diagnosed. man. Thank you. So, but the interim of that is, or the, the, the cause and effect is that I got cancer. I had to quit. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed in April. We were going on the road. I had to quit to have the cancer treatment. That's uh, Anthony got involved and, and did, does a great job with it. I had to go at the time I had stage four cancer. I didn't know whether I was going to survive that or not. And yeah. so, um, you know, by the time I got done the treatment, it was all the way till October of 2015. And, you know, Jake had his band completely together and, and uh, at the time and were touring and making another record. So I applauded what they were doing and support what he was doing. It's just the way, you know, every now and then God throws you a curveball and yeah, sometimes and you, you hit it sometimes you know yeah well curveball i like your baseball reference greg you like um, that? <laughs> and, and i read that you were like with the chemo treatments you were like almost at the most extreme amount that the body can handle is that is that fiction or fact um the most radiation you can have um at one time in a certain my cancer was in my mouth i had it on stage four tongue cancer of all things my big mouth finally got me in trouble and um, I had 43 doses of radiation in my mouth. You're allowed 44 doses. Wow. So the side effect of that is, of course, all your hair falls out, your teeth. You look like a meth addict. And, you know, it's yeah. just one of those things when you're going to have that amount of radiation. Mm -hmm. But at the time when I was diagnosed, they said you have between eight and 11 months to live unless we do this radical procedure. So immediately within a week, they cut me from here to hear and took out my lymph nodes because my cancer had spread to my lymph nodes. Oh, and uh, so 
fortunately, and that's one of the things about Red Dragon Cartel, if I I had cancer when I was in Red Dragon Cartel in 2014, I, I did, just didn't know that I had it. I, mm. I had the symptoms of it and I knew something was wrong with me. I'm kind of a health nut. And so I was uh, sick on on tour with them and i thought well it's just because i'm in i'm back east it's snowing it's december we're mm -hmm. in buffalo new york we're in uh toronto philly. freezing our yeah philly freezing our asses off so maybe that's why i'm sick i'm just not used to it <laughs> well when i got back from tour uh in january or the end of december i was still sick and i started showing some signs of having something more than just a cold mm -hmm. so by the time i was diagnosed if I had awaited to get diagnosed till after the tour, we were supposed to tour from April till October, end of October. I would have come back. I would have been sick the whole time and I would have come back and died that next spring because I wouldn't have even went to the doctor while I was on tour. I would have just blown it off. So the fact that it happened to present itself with what ended up being like a swollen lymph nodes, yeah. which is not normal. So I finally saw a guy that diagnosed it correctly. I had to tell Jake that I, look, I can't, I got to quit. And um, I got to have this treatment, this and that. And, and he was supportive of, you know, the, you know, take care of yourself, blah, blah, yeah. blah, don't die, <laughs> that kind of thing. And, and so I missed the, sh the boat of being in Red Dragon Cartel, which I enjoyed being in the band. Um, but I enjoyed, you know, my Health daughter- and family. Well, my daughter was a sophomore in high school when the, yeah. when the doctor, when the doctor said, uh, well, you have stage four cancer. I said, well, how many stages are there? And he said, uh, four. I said, well, what's the prognosis? And he said, uh, he said, um, you have between eight and 11 months. I said, well, what do I do? He says, go to, go on a vacation, eat whatever you want. Cause there's a good chance you're not going to survive it. And my exact words were, and I'm going to use them. I said, fuck that. I said, I got a 16 year old daughter in high school. I'm not checking out right yeah. now. I said, what do I got to do to get this taken care of? And he said, well, we got to go in like right away and take this, your lymph nodes out. Well, I, I carry a knife. And so I opened my knife right there to the doctor and I said, I snapped it open. I said, have at it. And he started laughing and my wife's standing there and she's going, oh my God. And there she's like, oh no. And he's laughing. He goes, no one's ever done that before. But within a couple of days, I was in surgery and they took out all my lymph nodes. And the, the upside of it is um, because I had the surgery right then, it was only in two of the lymph nodes. Now they took oh. out all the ones on this side. If I had waited another month, it would have, I don't know how much you know about the lymphatic system, but if it in, gets in your, that's the highway to every other organ in your body. So I would have ended up with cancer in my- Everywhere spleen or my stomach or wherever it goes through everywhere so i caught it um or he caught it just before um it turned into what would have killed me so um, just let me get this straight because i sense you have a great sense of humor um they um they put you under when they um use the knife not just like in the doctor's office where you said go out oh no you gotta you gotta go it's the real deal so they yeah i got I uh, something like 799 stitches inside my wow. neck here and uh and so <laughs> a funny story i'm in the hospital and and uh they have you on morphine and i had my own room for about two or three days and then on the fourth day or the third day at the end of the third day i think it was i wanted to go home i was already sick of being there and i don't like you know the morphine wasn't it did its job but i'm not a, i don't like drugs and so uh, they brought in some other dude to share my hospital room with me. They had the bed next to mine. And uh, he was a, a, a guy off the street. And I mean, he was, it was not a pleasant scenario with him there. And I, I told my doctor, I said, look, man, I want to go home now. And he said, you got to be off morphine and you got to have that, that catheter out of you before you can do it. So right there, I just pulled it all out right then on no. the spot. Pulled the one out of my neck, the one out of my arm, the one that they have in a certain part of your body. Oh, uh, you go to the bathroom. I pulled them all out right there and said, here. And he, said, he said, well, OK, let me 
let's fix what you just screwed up, but you can go home. And so I went home like a couple hours later. I just, I don't like the hospital. No one does. And I don't like drugs. I don't like, you know, the feeling you get from it. And I just went home and convalesced at home within a week. I, I, at the time I was teaching baseball at a place in uh, Tempe, Arizona called Arizona world of baseball. And it was a place that had multiple batting cages and pitchers mounds and they would run a summer camp every year for nine weeks. And I was the director of that summer camp for five years. My son worked with me there. My son had played baseball in college. My daughter played softball in high school. She was an instructor and I had a number of high school and former college guys as my instructors with me. And I ran it, it'd be anywhere from like 25 to 65 kids a day, five days a week for nine weeks. So I missed one week of that and went right back to teaching baseball after having this, you know, major surgery on my neck and, and, uh, and all that. And I was back doing what I do because I, I couldn't start radiation and chemo until my neck healed up enough for me to be getting that level of radiation. You go to radiation five days a week. So I had 43 radiations and 15 chemos and, um, None of them are fun, but I'm here to no. talk about it now. Well, that's awesome. You're an inspiration for um, for everybody, Greg. I got to say, you. too, you're obviously a big baseball fan. Are you a D-backs fan? You know what? I was till they traded my favorite player to the St. Louis Cardinals. Now I my favorite team who's it is who's ever playing the D-backs. <laughs> Even though Roger Klein, you must know Roger, who wrote the D-backs wing. I know who he is. I, we, I, if, if I've ever met him. I, I wouldn't know. I mean, he runs in a completely different circle. Yeah. Yeah. From musically, from what I do. And I mean, yeah. his music is cool, but I mean, he's from this whole, there was a big scene here in the 90s, the Tempe scene that they thought was going to turn into the same kind of thing that happened in Seattle. Mm-hmm. And it did. But um, there are a few bands that got some notoriety out of it, Roger Klein being one of them. But I didn't move back here from LA till 96. So, oh, okay. When I got here, that was already kind of uh, fizzling out a little bit. So yeah. um, if I've met him, it would have been in passing. I don't know if he knows who I am. And and I only well, I'm sure him. he does. I'm sure he does. If, if, if he walked by me, I wouldn't know who he was. But if you know, I yeah. would have, I, I wouldn't mind meeting him. He's 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 what you call a musical survivor. And I'm I'm a I'm a fan of anyone that is keep pushing the pile forward yeah. when it's definitely not easy anymore. Oh, for sure. Um, I'm going to put all the links to um, Red Dragon Cartel, Badlands, um, your uh, solo album, um, everything I can find. Even the music store, we'll plug that sure. um, down below. Everybody, if you need lessons uh, and you're in the Phoenix, uh, Tempe area, go in and get an autograph first and then ask for, um, <laughs> just tell them you're going to sign up for lessons. And then when they stand in front of you, just ask them for an autograph and then you can get the lessons if you want. But at least get Greg's uh, autograph because he's a survivor. He's a funny guy. He's a great storyteller, by the way. You're a great storyteller. I didn't even have to do much talking. I've, um, heard, I've heard that before. Yeah, you're great. Uh, you're very well read. And you're a very good uh, speaker. And um, favorite, since you left Canada, um, do you still have a favorite Canadian uh, band, artist, or anything? Um, well, I, I was a big fan of Coney Hatch. Oh, yeah. Um, back in in that time i also like max webster okay, Metro, there was yeah. a band that made just a, I, don't, I know they made a couple records because i have two of them they may have made more they're called the hard way okay and, oh no i'm sorry they're called wireless oh yeah yeah and the album's called the hard way um i like uh obviously i like some rush uh i can take a little triumph here and there oh um, wow yeah uh, uh uh, April wine and yeah. actually, I like Bachman Turner overdrive some stuff. So, so I mean, there's the, all the stuff you've got down here in the States. I'm sure there's bands in Canada. There was a band called Toronto. That, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. chick singer that I, I like Sass Jordan. Uh, I know she's from Canada. Head pins, Lee Aaron, a lot of them. Head pins, Lee Aaron. I mean, it, it could go on and on. The, the drummer from Red Dragon Cartel was, is, I mean, the singer from Red Dragon Cartel who's from Toronto was the drummer in a Canadian band. And I can't remember the name of them. Now you might know who that is. Um, Um, I'll have to look it up myself. (laughs) 
Uh, yeah, and they, I guess they were very successful in Canada and, and I'm just drawing a complete blank. And then the drummer, uh, Jonas, he played in a, in a number of uh, stoner kind of projects, which I do enjoy some of that kind of stuff now. And then it kind of has a Sabbath bent to it. Yeah, yeah. And so when I would, when we were on the road, they would kind of turn me on to different things that were more obscure in the States, but more well-known mm -hmm. in Canada. Yeah, it's a hard market for a Canadian to get into these days. Well, I mean, back in the day, it was probably a little harder. Much music helped it out. And now, you know, social um, social media really helps it out. Um, I'd like to thank you. Uh, last question. What's the opposite of unsubscribe? What's that? What's the opposite of unsubscribe? The opposite of unsubscribe. Subscribed. Everybody do as the legend says and subscribe to the channel for these great interviews. <laughs> and... Uh, but thanks a lot for your time, Greg. Uh, you got me, dude. I was like, wait a minute, there's a trick question in here somewhere. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, I get subscribe. a lot of yeah, subscribe. I'm lot. telling you to subscribe. And if you're in Phoenix, come and see me. You, you'd be surprised how many people come in with a something that I've done, including a Pat Travers record and uh, uh, Badlands. They'll come in with a cassette or an album. And I'll even get guys that will send me a message and say, if I send you this, will you sign it for me? And I'll say, if you send it in a self-addressed stamped envelope, I'll sign it and send it back to you. So uh, I'm pretty agreeable with all that stuff. Someday no one will care. And the fact that people still do, um, you know, is Well, important. I got a request. Sure. You, uh, you guys have t-shirts at your music store, right? I do. You sign one for me and mail it to me. <laughs> I will, and I'll even send you. I'll send you a signed Atomic Kings uh, CD as well. And, you do uh, that. I'll hold it up in my next interview. Okay, we'll, we'll sell some merch for you. I will. I'll sell. I'll send you. What? Uh, just when send me a message when we get off here, mm -hmm. and what your size is and and your address and all that, and I'll take care of it. Hey, this works. Hey, I've always been of the you ask. You, if you don't ask, you don't know. So, don't thanks. ask, you don't know. I'm uh, again, like I said, I'm pretty agree agreeable to a lot of this kind of stuff, and um, yeah, appreciate it. Being in Red Dragon Cartel put put me back on a map that I didn't think I'd ever get back on. So I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty easy going about it. Well, we're we're happy to see you, and you're looking healthy as hell, man. So Good thank brother. your wife for appreciate setting it. up the video and. Um, I'll get this interview up, Greg, in the next, I'd say, 48 hours, and I'll send it to you, buddy. Thanks again. Okay, my pleasure.